March of 2004, a test plane mounted on a rocket carried aloft by a bomber made history at Edwards Air Force Base north of Los Angeles. Launch, launch, launch. After release from its B-52 mothership, the small unmanned X-43 flew with the amazing speed of Mach 7, faster than any known jet aircraft has ever flown. It was a very significant event. Some people have even gone so far as to equate it actually with the Wright brothers' flight. When it separated from the rocket, the X-43 accelerated on its own power to Mach 7. Mach 7 is approximately 5,000 miles per hour, so you can imagine flying New York to Los Angeles in just over a half an hour. The NASA Dryden Flight Research Center says the scramjet-powered X-43 is capable of reaching at least Mach 10. A scramjet is a supersonic combustion ramjet. The ramjet, sometimes called the flying stovepipe, is one of the simplest engine designs ever conceived, with virtually no moving parts. It's basically a hollow tube into which fuel is injected and ignited. Unlike regular jets, there are no compressor blades inside to compress the air. In a ramjet, supersonic air is slowed down to subsonic speed inside the jet engine. But in a scramjet, the air moves through the engine at supersonic speed. The X-43 uh, vehicle has to endure some very extreme temperatures. The temperature along the leading edges of the vehicle, for example, are in excess of 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The front of the X-43 and the leading edges of the tail are made of carbon-carbon, a lightweight and strong composite material that can withstand extremely high temperatures. Carbon-carbon that we use is sort of a high-tech cousin to carbon fiber. It's a, the, the carbon itself is different. It's, it's a much higher temperature. The bonding agent is much higher temperature. It's good to 3,000 degrees without degrading. It doesn't wear away. What you see is the front end of the vehicle, the tungsten nose. Uh, the very front uh, edge is the carbon-carbon leading edge that provides the thermal protection. As you can see, there's a lot of complicated uh, machinery and uh, very densely packed systems inside this vehicle in order to make it work. A number of small electric motors on the aircraft are controlled by computer signals from the ground. Two motors on these electric actuators move the surfaces. That's how we maintain control of the vehicle in flight. Keeping the fuel burning inside the engine at supersonic speeds has been described as trying to keep a match lit in a hurricane. The flame doesn't really blow out because there are areas in the engine, small areas that aren't supersonic, that allow a flame to grab hold and to sustain itself. There's something about flying that fast that I think just captures the imagination of, of folks. Uh, it's just phenomenal to imagine flying that fast. I'd say the main interest you find for the scramjet in the near term would be the military. They would like to have a missile that goes, say, Mach 5, Mach 6, 5 or 6 times the speed of sound, so it can get to a target very quickly and has a lot of range in doing that. You can do that now with a solid rocket motor, but it runs out of gas pretty quickly. The Air Force is also interested in using scramjet propulsion for super-fast bombers that could strike anywhere in the world with amazing speed flying more than 10 times as fast as current bombers. There's no reason that a uh, human couldn't pilot or, or be a passenger on a hypersonic airplane. Vision vehicles, as we call them, include uh, space access vehicles to take uh, astronauts to the space station or to, uh, to orbit, and also potentially passenger vehicles, again, to take people uh, to the other side of the world. Some experts believe the scramjet could usher in a whole new era in aviation. We entered the 19th century moving at six miles an hour, the speed of an animal-drawn vehicle. We entered the 20th century moving at 60 miles an hour, the speed of a steam locomotive. We entered the 21st century at 600 miles an hour, the speed of an intercontinental jet airliner. And if you plot this in semi-logarithmic fashion, you get a nice straight line that indicates we may well enter the next century at 6,000 miles an hour, which is precisely where you see the X-43 really pointing us and heading in that direction. The X-43 scramjet is carrying on a tradition of cutting-edge aircraft development that goes back decades. And although Mach 7 is a major accomplishment for an air-breathing jet engine, rocket-powered planes were flying almost that fast decades ago. 
It all began with the most amazing series of extreme aircraft in aviation history. They were called the X-Planes, the X standing for experimental. The very first X-Plane was appropriately named the X-1. In 1944, the United States decided to bite the bullet, really, and develop a specialized family of research airplanes, of which the X-1 was first, that would essentially use the sky as a laboratory and which would carry 500 pounds of recording instrumentation and at the same time would also radio very important values that were measured in flight down to ground stations. This marked the birth, really, of a remarkable family of airplanes that continues to the present day, the so-called X-Series. The Bell X-1 is arguably the most famous pure research aircraft ever built. Bell Aircraft built three X-1 rocket planes for the primary purpose of breaking the sound barrier. For decades, traveling faster than the speed of sound, about 660 miles an hour at high altitude, had seemed an impossible task, hence the term barrier. It literally was seen by many as an impenetrable wall. This was really brought home in September 1946 when Britain's leading test pilot, Geoffrey de Havilland, the son of the founder of the de Havilland Company, was killed at about eight-tenths the speed of sound flying a new swept-wing tailless research airplane called the de Havilland Swallow. The airplane began to pitch violently out of control so rapidly that he could not control it, and within less than a second it had disintegrated and he was killed. This showed that the sound barrier had very real bite. In 1947, a young Air Force pilot named Chuck Yeager was about to bite back. It would happen at Muroc Air Force Base in California, about 80 miles north of Los Angeles. We know it now as Edwards Air Force Base. Robert Cardenas, another young fighter pilot, was officer in charge on the X-1 program, and he piloted the bomber that carried the X-1 aloft. I had professors from Caltech and MIT that were out there at Muroc. We had all sorts of uh, <laughs> people making recommendations, and one of them said, you know, really, we've seen stuff coming in from space explode, whether it was from heat or what, um, there could be an ultrasonic barrier out there that might just disintegrate or melt the aircraft. The test pilots and engineers listened politely to the experts and then got down to business. Bell Aircraft test pilot Chalmers Goodlin made the first powered flight in an X-1 aircraft in late 1946. But it would be Chuck Yeager who 10 months later would take the X-1 rocket plane to the speed at which it was meant to fly. Chuck is a human being, but when he gets in that seat and he locks that door, he becomes part of the machine. In my book, he's no longer a human. He, he's part of that, he melds in as part of that machine. Man and machine finally broke through the sound barrier in October of 1947. On the ground, observers heard the crack of a sonic boom. Air Force Captain Chuck Yeager and the X-1 had just launched a new era of supersonic flight. Chuck was the X-1, period. That was it. And I really don't know if anyone else could have done it. High air speeds are described in Mach numbers using a formula named after an Austrian physicist, Ernst Mach. The speed of sound is Mach 1, and Yeager had reached Mach 1.06 on that historic flight. Later generations of X-1 aircraft would fly twice that speed. In 1953, Chuck Yeager took one of them to Mach 2.44. Many more X-planes would follow the X-1, but none would provide more crucial research data than the X-15. rocket-powered X-15 aircraft flew 199 flights from 1963 to 1967. Far beyond supersonic, these research planes ushered in the era of hypersonic flight, the term for speeds greater than Mach 5. We had a 57,000-pound thrust rocket engine that was completely throttleable, the first of its kind, and you had tremendous problems in simply making this a reliable propulsion system. Now, once we did, 
All speed and altitude records very quickly were eclipsed by this airplane. It went out and immediately took us in a, in a piloted sense to Mach 4, Mach 5, Mach 6. As rocket planes like the X-1 and X-15 made amazing progress pushing the limits of speed, they paved the way for a new top secret aircraft that to this day inspires awe, the SR-71 Blackbird. In 1967, one of the X-15 set a speed record for manned flight in a winged aircraft, exceeded only by the space shuttle. Extreme aircraft will return on Modern Marvels. Cloaked in secrecy, two American spy planes, the U-2 and the SR-71 Blackbird, made their mark on history during the Cold War. The U-2 was the first to become operational in 1956. originally for the CIA by the Lockheed Advanced Development Projects Group, better known as the Skunk Works. The U-2 could fly higher than any aircraft in existence at the time and provided crucial intelligence on Soviet military activities. When there was worry that the Soviet Union might be gathering a bomber fleet or might be gathering its forces for an attack on Western Europe or whatever else it might be up to, there was no way literally to penetrate this Iron Curtain, say fly over it. To operate at 70,000 feet and higher, the U-2's jet engine had to be virtually hand-built with much closer tolerances to reduce air pressure losses at high altitudes. Flying long transatlantic missions alone at night, navigating only by the stars with a sextant, the U-2 pilots collected intelligence that dramatically improved America's ability to assess the Soviet threat. The U-2 operations really gave rise to some remarkable images. There was imagery brought back that showed Soviet fighters trying to climb and catch it, stalling, spinning out of control, falling to earth, other airplanes trying to do so-called pop-ups to get to altitude. Clearly, they knew we were there, but they were very frustrated at not being able to reach us with airplanes. The long, wide, straight wings of the U-2 gave the plane glider-like characteristics and it would soar so far above the ground that even if the Soviet military detected it, they couldn't reach it with fighters or missiles. Or so it was believed until May 1st, 1960. On that day, Francis Gary Powers was shot down by Soviet missiles as he took photos from 67,000 feet. After Powers successfully ejected, the Soviets put him on trial for espionage. The incident severely strained US-Soviet relations. Powers was released two years later. Today, high altitude reconnaissance is done mainly by satellites, but an updated version of the U-2 has provided battlefield intelligence in Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq. It is also being used for high altitude research projects by NASA and other civilian agencies. We do Earth sciences. NASA has done it for 30 years or more. And that requires overflight over forest fires, over forests, desert, um, into the Arctic to check on the, uh, the ozone layer, which NASA first discovered. We fly a bigger variant of the U-2. But we have two of them, and we fly them worldwide on various missions of those kinds. As effective and enduring as the U-2 has been, it wasn't enough to meet America's reconnaissance needs at the height of the Cold War. Once again, the Lockheed Skunk Works, headed by the legendary Kelly Johnson, was tapped to come up with something better. And in 1962, they outdid themselves. The SR-71 Blackbird a high-speed, high-altitude spy plane is revered by many as one of the greatest jet planes ever built. The ethereal Blackbird could fly higher and faster than any jet aircraft in production, and that still holds today. I knew that this airplane was going to be the fastest in the world. What I didn't know was it re would remain the fastest for 40 years. That's astonishing. But I remember back in the 60s, 